Judge Lane. You're a 17 year old girl. I was called and I'm gonna become a nun and there's really nothing that you can say that's gonna make me change my mind. Good afternoon, all of you. Since unfortunately God can't be here to run this convent himself, my voice will serve as a stand-in for his. You'll be spending the next six months as postulants. After that, we can enter the novitiate. Any questions? Put your hand down, sister. Postulants don't have questions. And you are free to go home. What is this you're reading? Something to do with this Vatican II. Our Pope has suddenly turned himself into some sort of reformer. Well, that's a good thing. Perhaps change is You good. think the church is in need of change? I happen to think the church is perfect the way it is. Are you still encouraging all of your novitiates for extreme acts of penance? I would like you to use the discipline on yourself. That's got to stop. I don't think you really understand what this will do to us. supposed to think about each other because we're not here for each other we are here only for god maybe i could just touch your hand in mercy again. we're really not supposed to touch like that what is going on here she looks like she's dying i think it's wrong of you to keep us in the dark the church gave me my work my community even my identity and now the church was trying to invalidate all that saying none of it matters so my question is what is it that really does still matter hey thanks for being here everybody uh congratulations on the movie uh maggie i'm gonna start with you i want to know uh you know where this came from what made you want to explore uh, this convent at this time as the Catholic Church was changing, uh, as well as just exploring this idea and version of, of love and being in love, which is so much of what the film is about. It was actually a, a total, happened like totally by accident uh, years and years and years ago when I was in an airport and I had picked up this biography of Mother Teresa, of all people, um, which I thought would be more of like a generic overview of like her life and works, but uh, it was actually like this compilation of all these letters and writings that she had done during the course of her life, and um, they were just so sort of like obsessively consumed with her love relationship with uh, God. And it was just like reading the whole thing, I was completely riveted. It was like very like sort of up and down and euphoric and deflated, and it was like it was like reading like the Beautiful and the Damned or something. It was just like this great like story of a love affair and I had never conceptualized the idea that I didn't I had never really given a great deal of thought that that nuns it, you know literalized this relationship so much and that it, and that they were so romantic and like and sacrificed so much and poured their hearts into it so that was then when you start doing research on nuns even a little bit the first thing that starts to appear is Vatican II because it had such a huge impact so that it, this is all like everything I just described happened over like six seven years but can you talk a little bit about what the sort of big changes that Vatican II, uh, Vatican II made to the church? Yeah, certainly. Like, by and large, Vatican II was, well, Vatican II is a series of reforms that came out of this council that Pope John XXIII uh, organized in, at the Vatican in 1962, and the council met for three years, all the way through to 1965. And the main purpose was to kind of, like, bring the church more in step with the modern world. It had like a very medieval Im image still. A lot of those sort of practice and the practices and things that were going on had been there since the beginning and were not really applicable to, you know, to like a contemporary Catholic. Um, so the idea was to kind of like, you know, sweep out the cobwebs, open the faith a little bit, make it more user friendly, while at the same time returning back to like the, some of the original liturgy, sort of taking out some of these sort of adaptations that people in various, you know, had, people had sort of adapted the faith to suit themselves and in that sense, like sort of contorted it a bit. Um, so by and large, it was like a really good thing. However, um, and the nuns were not at all like the, the center of the conversation about Vatican II. Um, but so they made these very sort of important reforms, like for example, that uh, the liturgy, which I mean the mass, which was previously said in Latin, would now be say, said in English, and um, the priest would face the congregation. And they also, Catholics were no longer supposed to consider themselves superior to other faiths. Like so, my Jewish friends are, are 
very aware of Vatican II because that was the first time that like the the they acknowledged that the, you know Jews, for example, had the right to have their view of of um, Christ. And so anyway, the nun, the nuns were really like sort of an afterthought, but they they. Um, at some point, they decided that uh, nuns no longer needed to wear a habit, and they should get out into the world. They didn't need to be living in convents, and uh, be more like, I guess, more like regular people, like these engaged women who were not. It was no longer necessary to make these like this extreme sacrifice on behalf of God and on behalf of this relationship with God. And in that, what what was implicit was that the, you were no longer a nun was no longer superior. Like her sacrifice would no longer make her superior. And I think they just didn't. Um, I think they just didn't ever foresee the consequences of what a slap in the face that was to so many nuns who had sacrificed everything, you know, uh, and given up so much for, in the name of their relationship with God, which was now altered. And so the, it, like 90,000 women ended up leaving, which was more than a third, way more than a third of the amount of nuns that were at that time. I just feel like I gave like a whole history lesson. That was great, thank you. <laughs> that was great. Uh, Melissa, your, your character is, is one of just incredible strength and she's leading this convent. And I think we're supposed to sort of deduce that, you know, as after, after the film, maybe, she, maybe she, she leaves or she can't be a part of this. I'm not necessarily sure if that's the case. But I'm wondering what you think about her in, in regards to a sort of liberal idea of feminism, which is this idea that, like, the church was opening women up to the world, yet this woman was already so strong and had sacrificed and had devoted so, so much of her, her own will and self to something that she loved. Well, the film is really, you know, about the experience of the young postulant that comes in, played so beautifully by R Margaret Qualley. Um, uh, so you don't really see Reverend Mother before receiving the Vatican II papers. Um, and you don't, as you're indicating, see her after the film either. So we can only speculate <laughs> what might go beyond. I don't feel at all like she's going anywhere, but um, you feel the opposite, and that's interesting. Um, so, You're wrong, uh, <laughs> but happy that's to, cool. Happy to be. Happy to be. Um, so when you know, you just you that's it's not her s story. You don't really know I, what you see in Reverend Mother in in uh, Maggie's film is her coming undone because. She was born around the time of the turn of the last century. If in fact, as she says at the beginning of the film, she's been there for 40 years, that woman has been inside those convent walls since the early 20s. The world was a different place. The choices for a woman, as limited as they are today, and as much as they still pay us less than the men, the choices were even more limited then. And the one person in the audience of any age is nodding her head, right? So for me, that's what this Reverend Mother's story is about, is a woman from another time who without question was rescued by her life in the convent and in my mind lived a life for 40 years of quiet contemplation, kind of like Gandhi. That in and of itself, even though she may not be representative of the new, the new, the incoming, changing world, she is representative of a of a strength, and I think of a of a somewhat subversive faith in in its own way. I only played one woman. She's not re representative of anything in my mind. She is only herself in my mind. Margaret, uh, your character uh, is completely devoted very early on to the church. Um, what did you know about this period of time and what, what drew you to this story? Um, also love the cameo by your brother from The Leftovers as well. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, yeah, he's great. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm not religious myself and I didn't know all too much about Catholicism, so it gave me an opportunity to, uh, read the Bible for the first time and, uh, imagine what it would be like to be so devoted to something. Um, I think, you know, uh, my character's attraction to religion, um, you know, it's not only the sort of 
peacefulness and the order and the structure, but also I think her relationship with God um, ideally was supposed to kind of feel like that of uh, first love, you know? And uh, that was something that I found really interesting about Maggie's take on the script is that she really wanted it to feel like Jesus was her first boyfriend. <laughs> and um, when she's, you know, praying in bed that uh, it should feel like she's talking to her boyfriend that's right beside her and have that um, level of intimacy towards it. So I think that was uh, interesting to think When about. you have something like that or the director gives you something like uh, that, that it's your first boyfriend, is that somewhat of an easier take or something that's a little bit easier to grapple with when you're performing rather than thinking about the big faith ideas and in every scene? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, you know, I think even the atmosphere of the church, uh, even as even though I'm not religious, there's something sort of sacred about being in a church, and there is sort of a kind of shift of the way that you feel, I think. Um, so I think that's helpful, and, uh, and, you know, quiet is helpful and makes you more introspective, I guess, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have a relationship with God, so uh, uh, making it more of a literal thing uh, definitely is helpful for me. Uh, Diana, you have some incredible scenes with uh, Melissa where the two of you are, are briefly spar. Uh, what was it like working with, uh, with Melissa in, in those scenes? She's a, kind of a master of them. We've yeah, definitely. Um, and also what I find really... Master plays with master. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very kind. Um, you know, I was so excited when I knew that she was coming on board as the whole cast. It just like felt like magic. And then what was interesting, and this happens so often, you're filming your hardest scene first. <laughs> I think that was the second day of filming that we filmed our, you know, our, uh, our scene where we're having that fight. And I think... You know, it was so great because we had had time to talk so much with Maggie about this and where we were going and how we were going to have to scale back, what we were going to have to build to, you know. Um, but I, I, I think that, no, having that scene first and playing everything after that was going to be leading up to that moment really informed so much of, like, the heartbreak and, and why it was going to be such a struggle for our characters because this was a relationship that we had had for many, many years. And you know that was a breakup that was extremely difficult. So um, I'm happy that we did it that way. But yeah, you're like, whoo, day two, and we're serious. Well, what I what I loved about that scene was there's only so far that your character can go, both emotionally or just emotionally with 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 the, with the mother there, because there's she still has so much respect for her and she's still very fearful of her and her place in the church. So as far as it seems like the argument is going to go. It has to kind of, you, you consistently have to, you cut yourself off emotionally and tonally in that scene, which I thought was really brilliant. And the director has me circling her, right? So master faces master, for sure. Which you do another time in the film as well. You kind of circle, I believe you were circling the other uh, young uh, novice that was there that you were... I did the blocking I was given. <laughs> Belittling, to, to say the least, and or punishing, to say the least. Uh, Joanne, you're really the one sort of secular woman uh, in, in the film, or uh, sort of representative, not representative, excuse me, let's say this one character. Uh, you are the one secular woman in the film, and you are not necessarily struggling to hold on to anything. You are struggling to hold on to your daughter, but at the same time, you, uh, I mean, did you feel like your character felt like as though she had failed as a mother by not being religious, even though she doesn't want to hold on, grab religion at all? I I don't think, I think, I mean, being a mother is really complicated and I think, I don't know, I'll speak for myself, I feel like I fail at it <laughs> every day in different ways. Um, I don't think she failed at it, I don't think she felt like she failed at it because she wasn't religious, I think she felt very comfortable and confident in, in her beliefs and didn't feel like she got that wrong. But she did feel like there was some there was something along the way that that she didn't do well that would lead her daughter to to seek out that life and that love and that path and that for me was the thing that was the hardest was imagining um, 
you know, she they had such a special and close relationship, both for daughter and I think as a single mother in that time, like there was a real friendship and um, for that to be taken away was was the big heartbreak. Yeah. I think w it seemed to me like what she sees is that your your character doesn't have much to hold on to and the thing that you don't have and that if you had God or if you had something else, it would be something stronger and more concrete that that your character would be able to hold on to. And that's sort of where she comes to God as a boyfriend initially because the, the husband leaves we see you like you know saying goodbye to I kicked him man. out Ricky I kicked, kicked him, him out, out excuse me okay. <laughs> no I, I'm sorry you were the <laughs> I'm kidding <laughs> he was an asshole you kicked him out <laughs> no she oh. she didn't have the she didn't have that in her life and I'm sure that was one of the driving forces for well I don't know but I would imagine that Seeing, seeing the the loss of that, the absence of that, I, I'm sure could could encourage a child to to seek that out for themselves. Yeah. Uh, Maggie, I'm curious. I, I want to take back to you a question that I was kind of bringing to Melissa earlier, which was this idea that we, uh, as a culture, sort of look on nuns as something that is, and I think as and with religious women in general in fundamentalist societies or fundamentalist areas, we we view them as oppressed and not making their own decisions. Where in this film, although there are you know strict rules in regards to how they can dress and behave, these are women that are sh defiantly making their own decision in the face of you know a, a secular parent or a society that is growing more 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 secular. And in that way, there is a kind of um, we we wouldn't normally categorize it as a kind of feminism, but there is a there is a sort of uh, a, a, a feminism there. If, if yeah, I know. I mean. Absolutely, and I think particularly the Reverend Mother character is like, she has governed her own society and her own community expertly and with no problems all this time. And so even with the arrival of the Archbishop and Vatican II, it's like, this is someone who's completely, who, 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 who has been completely successful in, in running her own community of women. And the, the intrusion of a kind of like male patriarchal authority and in fact, her rebellion against it, le it, she basically rebels against it leading up to the point where it's, she's, you know, it's like a choice, she's gonna lose her job, she's gonna lose her convent if she rebels any further. But her rebellion is to me an act of, a feminist act in a way. There's only two men in the film and they're, it's, it's very brief and it's Dennis O'Hare at one point who the mother is, is in defiance of and then it's the sort of shitty dad at the, be <laughs> the beginning of the, uh, of the film. And that seems like a very clear choice what did your crew look like as well behind the scenes? There's two other men in the movie. There's two other men? God and Jesus. <laughs> Touche, Melissa Leo. Touche. I really wanted to interrupt because I do hear what you're asking about, and I do feel that it is important to say that nuns throughout my lifetime, 57 years now, have been at the forefront, Mother Teresa, of the peace movement, of education, of all kinds of things. In fact, that habit gave them a certain kind of freedom. Think of the women who were killed down in El Salvador. Nuns. I'm, uh, what did your crew look like? I mean, was this for the most part a, a sort of an, an all-woman adventure making the film? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we had almost all female department heads, with the exception of the uh, with the exception of the um, set designer. Props. Props. <laughs> Props. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I, I personally just really like enjoy working with women. I, I. Um, I think I haven't I haven't had as been on a set that was predominantly male, and then with the extras and the extras in the in the film were just an amazing group of women. Like I, it, they, they were amazing, and they were so engaged, and they were so much a part of set life in a way. You know, I think there were like something like anywhere from eighty to a hundred there on the days when we were shooting, and they and they very much felt like a part of the community. So that's a lot of women. You know, that's something like close to like two hundred women. <laughs> around in, on a, in certain days on set. And um, I don't have anything to compare it to, but I've always just li really liked working with women. And I, I, um, I, I can't say that it would have been, I can't say that I know what the movie would have looked like if, if it was, if the sort of gender makeup was different, but I, it, was, it, was a, it was a lovely environment in that regard.
Was it difficult to get uh, to secure funding for a film about nuns that was actually about belief and faith and and love in this period of time? I, I said to you in the green room, the majority of movies about nuns that I think of off the top of my head are, for the most part, you know, exploitation films or they're uh, in consistently more uh, salacious in, in their depiction. Yeah. Um, as I brought the film around to people, I think that what was difficult was to convey um, how uh, vibrant and like war warm is perhaps not the right word, more inviting than you would think. I think people pictured a very like sort of gothic, almost like a yeah. Merchant Ivory film from like the late 80s, where, which would be very sort of like super austere, super cold. You know, in the history of nun movies, you you have things like Bells of St. Mary or the nun story that are, are very like kind of glamorous, like lush cinematic. But the more recent canon is things like um, Agnes of God and Ida and Doubt, which is a colder, less inviting world. And I, I, I think it's difficult totally when you have a script to convey to anybody what the vision is, but the idea that it was something that like more than just a very specific kind of art house audience that has a tolerance for a cold or feeling movie would be invited into this movie because it was going to be sort of more colorful visually and 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 warmer and uh, more textured. So um, it's always I'm sh this is my first movie, so I, you know. But I think it's Congratulations, always. Congratulations! It's amazing. <laughs> It's always very difficult, I think, to co there's it's difficult to find adjectives. It's difficult to convey to people what you are seeing in your head, and then it's even more difficult for them to believe that maybe then they, they now they understand your vision, but then like they're like, can you actually do that, or would you you know do you have the capacity to? So, they, I, but I think every filmmaker like probably has that to some or lesser or greater degree, what, whatever their project is. Let's get some questions um, from you people, the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Uh, Diana, my question is for you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for all the work you've done for PETA and LGBT and all the uh, war veterans that you've worked with and the Syrian refugees. Um, is there any similarity between yourself and your character um, in regards to the relationship of God, of you and with God and faith in general? Because you did go to a religious uh, school and you have a religious background. I do have a religious background. Thank you. Um, I do have a religious background. It was much more structured um, as a child. I was raised Jewish. Um, I was bat mitzvahed. It was very much um, my identity in, in many good ways and bad. I lived in San Antonio for a few years, and I was really badly teased while living in Texas for, for religion. So it was always kind of this confusing thing because, you know, I had family who would tell me our legacy within and our history, and then I had schoolmates that I was made to feel shame for it. And then I moved to San Francisco at a young age. And then it was just like, oh, it's just a nothing thing. Like, cool, you're a Jew. Um, and I was like, <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know, but like there were moments in my life where there were policemen outside of my temple, and I thought that was a normal thing. So it, as I've grown older and as I've traveled and as you know, I've talked to so many people in so many different cultures about what their beliefs are, I think it's been important for me to understand that I definitely have faith. It's um, not necessarily typical or you know, reflective of how some of my family feel or anything like that. I went to Israel last year for the first time and spent a lot of time there kind of <laughs> learning the ins and outs and everything um, as much as I could. So I do think it's fascinating. And I do think that um, my next question will be, when I have kids, what is what is the story that I'm gonna take them on and how I'm gonna involve them. I think it's really interesting and I'm not there yet. I think this film um, definitely kind of gave me a new light into uh, a world that I obviously didn't, you know, that wasn't my upbringing. Um, and I just think that uh, there's real beauty in understanding what uh, each individual person has to say about it. And that's what we're hearing in this movie. You know, uh, and that's why I love making movies. The conversations that we're having around this movie are deeply personal, um, and uh, I find it really interesting. 
You reminded me of something in the film that I loved, which is Julianne's character taking her young daughter to church as a sort of secular woman and being like, I'm going to expose you to religion, and you're not going to care, so whatever. And then the worst nightmare coming true, <laughs> like, right from that. I just love that storyline. Uh, next question. This question is for uh, Maggie. Um, with this being your first uh, feature film uh, that you directed and written, uh, uh, for years uh, doing uh, documentarian work, was it easy transitioning from something that with a real format to a narrative? You mean documentary to fiction? Um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it was easy. I mean, you're working with so many more people when you're making a feature film, and so the whole environment of a set is like. You, you have so many things that you have to learn so, so fast. Um, but then on the other hand, like, when we got to the edit, like, it was weird because, like, the first cut of the movie was, like, three hours, and everyone was like, whoa, you are screwed. Like, you're never going to find a movie. And I was like, oh, my God, like, because I had made a documentary, and I shot 180 hours, and we cut it down in the course of a year to 84 minutes. And I was like, this is nothing. Like, you know, I was not at all worried about it, which is funny how. But um, I think that, like... I think that they're both really challenging in a lot of different ways. Um, Did you find that having made a documentary when you went to shoot scenes on uh, on the day that you were a bit more aware of like everything that you needed to to take into the editing room? Um, coverage wise and stuff yeah. like, but that's sort of like such a given when you get when you get to a film like this. Um, yeah, I mean. Documentary, you're always like, you don't have the coverage, you don't like have the cutaways, you have to like be so creative about that stuff. It's it's like almost like sort of blissful to at least know that like, you know, you're shooting in so many different sizes and you're uh, you know occasionally grabbing like detail shots and stuff, and that you will be covered. Um, but uh, there's something also like totally like uh, so um, like masochistically awesome about making a documentary because it's like you're literally just hate your life so much when you're editing it but it <laughs> when you get through to the other side it's it's it you just feel like wow I can't believe that we even had made a movie at all from what we shot so it's kind of both are great I think we have time for one more question Hi, uh, this is for all of you what's your favorite scene in this film well me on the spot. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know. I have a lot of favorite scenes. Um, I love the scene where Melissa addresses um, all of the nuns and, uh, you know, basically is telling them that the reform is implying that their work to date is, you know, makes them no less special. They don't no, no longer have a closer seat to God and heaven according to the Catholic Church. Um, and I think that scene is uh, really heartbreaking and uh, beautiful, but yeah. It's kind of, that one's kind of my favorite too, just because of the, I mean, Melissa does such a beautiful job and then the extras were so with her and so, and you, you have, to, well, <laughs> you guys probably haven't seen the movie, but the extras had did not have the script. They didn't have the information. They were just sort of told, like, you're going to be something. You're going to be told something in the middle of this. Uh, in the middle of this uh, speech that basically invalidates your sense of purpose in life, and you're free to cry or you're free to. And then, I, you know, I think they were just so with Melissa because Melissa's work was so beautiful, and they just. I was just astounded and never anticipated that that this room full of extras would just sort of unite in this moment. And I just, it was very like touching to me how committed everybody was, but particularly these women that didn't even, that were there for the day and didn't know what the, didn't, they hadn't read the script, so they didn't really understand everything. Yeah, that's an amazing feeling when your extras get involved like that. So Cause beautiful. yeah. They're just, they're it's like a like give, it's just, they're just so giving. Like it's just, they don't have to, I mean, you know. Yeah. That's like, where's holding? Like, yeah, 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 I mean. <laughs> uh, Dana? Um, I'll talk about a different scene then. Um, <laughs> you all have the favorite scene. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, I mean, I have, if I'm thinking about two, like, 
the ones that I filmed, I loved the moment where I was telling the girls that I was leaving and kind of that, like, that was also, I think the last thing that I shot and that was really heartbreaking and it just felt so r real. So when I played that and when I saw it in the movie, I just remembered how much that felt really real. I find it I I find it hard to choose a favorite scene, um, but I loved I loved that one in particular also, and 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 just something overall I I just as Maggie said and I didn't have as much experience with all of the the sisters, but that feeling of of them being part of this thing was really beautiful and um, and and bringing that story of these women giving their whole lives to this one thing and then having it yanked away and seeing that land on them and those beautiful real faces of all ages. I just, I just love, I love that, that side. I thought Maggie did such a beautiful job capturing that. The, the, those, the extras down in uh, Nashville were extraordinary. And that is, you know, there, there are of course as all kinds of people in the world, but my experience of our, um, the extras in our union are comrades in arms. Those women, the young and the elders and the ones of all age that joined us with great seriousness day after day and much too much smoke and kneeling on stone floors and the work that those women put in is an extraordinary part of the film. I do not choose favorites ever of anything. I am such a lucky girl that gets to do this amazing thing. But when you ask the question, the thing that comes to my mind is to watch this mother-daughter relationship between these two phenomenal actors as, it, as you are introduced to, to them and as it grows and as it changes o over time. That mother-daughter relationship is, is an extraordinary part of the film. Maggie, when can people see the film? This weekend. This weekend. If you're in New York and LA, it opens tomorrow. And if you are not in New York and LA, and not within eight hours driving distance, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're <laughs> off the hook then. Yeah. yeah. Oh, eight, eight, eight and a half hours. So you should know. Uh, it opens wider release in uh, two weekends, I think. All right. Thanks so much. Congratulations Thank on a beautiful first film. Thank you so much for Thank being here. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>